Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our Wireless Trends webinar um, to talk about CBRS and 5G and LTE. Um, this is hosted by Double Radius, and um, we're gonna, it's going to be more of a panel style. So I'm going to be one of the moderators. I'm the Director of Business Development at Double Radius, and then Gary Ford, our president, will also be the, the other moderator with me. And then just to quickly introduce um, our panel, we have Jesse Rosh, from, um, he's CTO of Bicel's Technologies. And then Tim Sill, who is the VP of Technology and Business Development at Alpha Wireless. Um, Justin Polak, who is our product, the product manager at Alpha Wireless. And then Musad Alfat, who is um, the VP of Technology and Development at Federated Wireless. So um, they're going to be, we're going to, we have a couple topics that we're going to talk about, but feel free as we go to submit your questions in the chat box. And Gary and I will ask them to the panel as we go through. And whatever we don't get to, we'll make sure to answer um, towards the end of, of the discussion. But you know, thanks again for, for attending this, this webinar. I think that all these topics, um, at least we've been talking about them for at least a year and a half and, and honestly longer um, when it comes to be, you know, when we're talking about CBRS and, and um, LTE, 5G is a little bit newer and kind of always termed as a marketing term, but we're, we're here to kind of discuss those trends, see where they're going, um, you know, how they affect the market. Um, so before we begin, I'm just going to have our panelists introduce themselves really quickly um, and then we can get started. So Tim, I will, I will have you start and do a quick introduction of yourself. Hi, thanks for, uh, thanks for having us on here, Katie. Uh, Tim, so with uh, Alpha Wireless, I really head up all the, uh, you know, development and, and strategy type of things for North America in our product line. I've been with Alpha Wireless uh, over four years now, and uh, you know it's an exciting time uh, to finally see CBRS uh, able to come to fruition and start being used in the market. So, but looking forward to this opportunity today. Yeah, us as well, um, Jesse. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Jesse, uh, CTO of Vice Sales North America, work closely yeah, with our R&D teams and um, pretty much our product roadmaps. Uh, software feature sets and so forth. So um, yeah, we've been last year or so been really focused on our 5G upcoming product line uh, to roll out. But uh, other than that, been 15 years, yeah, about 15 years now in the wireless space. Um, so yeah, looking forward to contribute here. Awesome. How about you, Justin? Perfect. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm Justin. Uh, I'm uh, at Alpha Wireless. I'm the senior product manager. I have a PhD in electromagnetics. Been in the industry for about six, seven years. Uh, I oversee a lot of the um, product development, working closely with our technical team and and uh, and our management team to kind of develop the products, release them, and, and manage their life cycle. Oh, awesome. Thanks, Justin. And last but not least, Masood from Federated. Yes, <coughs> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Masood Olfad. Uh, I am the Vice President of uh, Technology and Ecosystem Development in Federated Wireless. Uh, um, I have been involved in CBRS from almost day one and been involved and uh, in some cases chairing the development of uh, every, every piece, every detail, bells and whistles in CBRS, uh, in WinForum, in uh, CBRS Alliance, as well as 3GPP, the work that we have done to enable CBRS in 3GPP. And also inside Federated Wireless, I'm in charge of technology development uh, and making sure that the products that we have are fully aligned with the regulatory and the technology. And also I, I work with the government entities, DOD, FCC, from a regulatory perspective as well. So I'm so glad to be here with you. No, we, as, us as well. Thank you so much, guys. So um, I think, you know, the first one, the first biggest trend that we've all been involved in and, and have been talking about for what seems like years is really, you know, CBRS and, and where is right now, what's the current state, um, you know, of the CBRS market. So we've been, it's about, a, we're coming up on a year that CBRS has been fully operational um, in the U.S. So Jesse, how how do you think that has, um, you know, now that it's been a year, um, have you seen like any change um, in the market with people, more people, more customers deploying CBRS? 
um, <laughs> now that we have this, you know, the SAS is all operational. Right. So um, obviously, so prior before, right, Part 96, you know, you know rules uh, came to, you know, fruition. Um, it's all been Part 90. Uh, so it's mostly fixed wireless, at least in U.S. market, um, you know, within the CBS band. And uh, so basically it was fixed wireless. A lot of WISPs deployed it, utilities. But it was mostly fixed wireless uh, private networks that were being used with this uh, spectrum. Um, CBRS obviously opened it up more, so so there's more spectrum to play with. Um, but yeah, since the launch of CBRS uh, officially uh, last year, um, you know we've definitely seen an uptick in a lot of new use cases, which you know we're very excited about. Uh, from the public space, obviously the carriers are have been actively deploying you know mostly what we see is in the urban spaces uh you know to help you know add uh obviously more more bandwidth there um so using a, as a supplemental carrier there uh private networks uh, it's no longer just for fixed wireless uh we're definitely seeing a lot of mobility type projects uh some examples might be like warehousing is probably one of the bigger ones uh so uh, think of situations where mobility is very important, um, along with security. So those are kind of the, the big key ingredients uh, when it comes to LTE within CRS. Um, and the fact is, you know, the spectrum is now available to everyone. So previously, you required some kind of license, right? Unless you're doing unlicensed spectrum, say with LTE, with this carrier technology, uh, you, there just wasn't much options, right, uh, to deploy. So CBRS opens that up. So it's there's a tremendous number of use cases. So you, you see everything kind of popping up, uh, you know, whether it's in the IoT spaces, uh, a, a lot of mobility cases. Um, but there's a lot of companies that are just building infrastructure and then, you know, using that to do neutral host type use cases where they'll, you know, have relations with the carriers to, to offer uh, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, inb inbound or outbound roaming agreements and so forth. Uh, so it's no longer just pure fixed. Of course, the fixed business has taken up, taken off even more so. And uh, what we see the biggest growth uh, from last year has been the education space. Mm -hmm. Since uh, the COVID situation, you know, really made that very apparent and obvious to everyone that. Um, not everyone has access to uh, the broadband. Um, even if they have it available uh, within their homes, even if they're in the urban, suburban areas, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're paying for it or getting the, that service. And uh, so the school districts, they've been you know, building their own networks uh, and they need a kind of nomadic uh, network where they can provide, say, Chromebooks, MiFi's, devices that the students can take around with them so whether they're on campus or they're in an extension of that network that they're building, you know, towards like say the low income areas, um, they need those devices to remain connected. Um, and they'll provide for fix, they'll provide the indoor CP as well uh, to ensure that they have, you know, broadband with their home. But I think um, the biggest use case right now has definitely been the education space and seeing that growth there. Hey, Jesse, has that been the biggest surprise for you? Because we all talked about a lot of use cases, but is, yeah. I know education's been an uptick, but yeah. has that a, been something you didn't anticipate? I mean, none of us could have anticipated the pandemic. That didn't seem to be in any of our textbooks, but is, it the, is that the biggest use case that you've been pleasantly surprised with? Uh, so we've always been, it's been kind of a slow roll before the pandemic, right? So there's a, and, and also it's like, it was kind of regional, like California, for example, is much more progressive with their funding and, and the schools, you know, building networks. Um, so, and they also had, there's also a spectrum piece of it. So some of the schools have that uh, EBS, right, 2.5 gigahertz spectrum. So a lot of them are building, you know, using that to build networks. Um, but after CBRS launched, it kind of coincided, right? Because CBRS launched soon after a pandemic happens. And uh, so schools that might have had ideas to build networks that couldn't because they didn't own the spectrum, you know, or have potential to do that, they now have the ability to do so 
whether or not they have the education broadband system right spectrum or not so that uh you know has definitely accelerated so we weren't so surprised to the idea that schools are building networks but obviously uh, <laughs> you know the the demand was much higher and quicker than we expected and then tie in supply chain issues due to the pandemic it was quite a rush right to deliver um products uh to everyone that needed it makes sense so okay can i add one to the uh... please so so thank you uh so first of all uh, we started the commercial deployment uh, february 2020 which is makes it almost more than one and a half year that we have been uh, commercially using cbrs uh, the number of uh, CBSDs, access points in the market, is right now exceeding uh, close to exceeding about one 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 thousand one hundred seventy thousand CBSDs in the market, and uh, which I can proudly say that Federated Wireless has a significant percentage of them as the uh, as the customer, and. Uh, um, as Jesse mentioned, uh, we have been seeing a lot of different use cases, very specifically Federated Wireless is addressing uh, some Arlington County education system as well as uh, basically the Carnegie Mellon University intelligent video and analytics uh, services for education perspective. So there has been lots of use cases going from mobility, education, uh, IOT warehouse, you've heard about the project that we've done for Albany uh, warehouse for DOD, the Department of Defense, and uh, also fixed, of course, uh, a significant number of those CBSDs that we have been using are fixed uh, devices. So uh, lots of use cases has been handled. And as we move on uh, and uh, new use cases are introduced, uh, and enabled by 5G, CBRS is addressing those. So uh, I can say that uh, it is a very, very healthy ecosystem after one and a half year, uh, despite the fact that we were in pandemic and we expect uh, much more growth in the near future. So have you had um, specifically fixed wireless? Have you noticed operators have any hesitancy getting on to the SaaS? Because I think um, we have seen that a little bit as, you know, customers, they're deploying or they, they had deployed, let's say, buy cells or Telrad or, you know, other CBRS, they originally Part 90, but then transitioned to Part 96 gear. Um, and they're, they're, it seems like they're, we are seeing a little bit of a hesitancy of them wanting to, to transition over onto the SaaS SAS maybe because they're afraid they're not going to have, you know, open spectrum or they don't want this monthly SAS fee. Are you seeing that as well? Well, uh, yeah, of course, hesitancy is there. This is a new system, especially for the Part 90 operators. And as you said, we have seen hesitancy. But uh, as soon as they get familiar and uh, they understand and they know the, the simplicity of the system, uh the, th that hesitancy goes away uh, obviously um cbrs is capable of providing a significant amount of spectrum especially especially in far rural areas uh, and for the fixed devices uh one of the reasons that we see interest on in that um i personally was uh, involved or in charge of the allocation of the pal licenses and pal channel sorry pal channels not licenses sorry after the licenses were issued by FCC, we, they, we worked on uh, allocating the PAL channels. And uh, uh, among about 220 PAL, uh, the priority access license bidders, uh, a significant number of them were the fixed, fixed uh, operators. And that showed the fact that the fixed operators, uh, as we move on in the time and gradually they are having trust on Part 96 and the fact that uh, uh, they're not going to lose a spectrum and uh, we are going to be able to not only uh, let them up continue operating in the upper 50, but also it opens the door, the lower 100. So it uh, lowers uh, the, opens the 150 megahertz open to fix operators. So uh, yes, hesitancy has been there, but as soon as they, are, they get educated and I, and I appreciate the 
the role that you guys are playing and Alpha and Vices and others for educating the operators that uh, uh, this is not going to be a major concern on their operations. Mm -hmm. and I guess speaking of you know the PAL licenses and, and that auction, it did seem out of the, the bidders and then the, the actual winners of the PAL licenses, a lot of them were utilities and from what we've seen, you know, a lot of these utilities are trying to combine the CBRS spectrum um, with either, you know, 900 megahertz or um, other spectrum to, to build out. Have, have you, and I know, you know, Tim, I know that you have been really involved in that. Um, and now, Justin, have you guys also seen that a lot? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, well, what we seen was kind of really interesting. And we didn't really anticipate it was the amount of, you know, the, um, you know, utility companies and some other um, uh, like oil companies and stuff like that getting involved with the, with the CBRS spectrum. Uh, when we've seen that type of change, you know, that really kind of helps, um, you know, accelerate, you know, what the FCC saw with the use of CBRS and the PAL licenses and and how to manage that, uh, that approach. Um, so that really opened up some additional opportunities for, for us as OEMs to go after all, you know, what we, viewed as it was a quite new segment uh, because we really didn't see, you know, because utilities are very slow to change mm -hmm. a lot of their network architectures. And, you know, unfortunately with, given what's going on with a lot of the security issues, uh, the hacking of networks, those type of things, and then the congestion in, you know, the free spectrum, this was really a lower point of entry for them to go in and get, you know, very secure spectrum, you know, partnering with, with uh, the LTE, radio vendors to create you know much more secure wireless access networks and then layering in you know the three and a half gigahertz you know that the amount of spectrum that's available you know they don't really typically need a bunch of spectrum you know five to ten megahertz is all they really need for a sensory network for them but you know we're also seeing some utilities getting access to offer broadband services across to their customers as well uh, which when you see those type of activities, then you know those PAL licenses can come into play for them for securing their their sensory networks, and then they can layer in the non-PAL licenses for capacity to serve some of their customers as well. Um, and you you know you touched on a good point about the 900 megahertz side. You know, Anterex has really kind of jumped in and, and try to help piggyback into that area as well with their 900 spectrum for coverage. So when you add those together, it really makes it interesting for, you know, for the utilities themselves. Um, you know, one thing that, you know, uh, that was discussed earlier about the, the education systems, you know, that was a, you know, we've seen some interest in that area, but once the, the CBRS stuff started really playing out that in the pandemic, that was a very big uh, area that came to light to us that was new. It's like, wow, we never seen so many school districts so interested in CBRS or, you know, even municipalities, um, you know, we've worked with a lot of municipalities now and, and some of their architectures of how do they go in and cover their whole city to, to provide uh, sensory networks for them, access for their their uh, employee bases, and those type of things. Uh, so, you know, with the, and then you take the fact that the way the FCC has uh, layered the rules in about use of PAL licenses, either use it or it can be used, Mm -hmm. That really helps too, because you know they know that in rural areas, you know whether it's T-Mobile, Dish, or whoever else that may have secured those spectrum uh, licenses out there, they may not get out there for years. Um, mm -hmm. So there's opportunities for them to go in there and discuss, you know, use of those PALs with them because they do have now the, the ability to sublet those licenses. Uh, so you know, I think the FCC and and just the lobbying behind CBRS in general has really done a really good job of trying to make it as flexible and as easy for uh, the different WISPs and different customers and base to use that spectrum as flexible as possible. So Katie, yeah. uh, I'm sorry, because uh, Tim was, was referring to subletting the spectrum, if you allow me to address. Uh, yeah, Tom. I was just going to bring that up. So go ahead. <laughs> I can I can wait uh, if you want. You know, no, but, no, go ahead. But so, so two two things. Number one is about the combining the CBRS with other bands. Um, if you and look at the 3GPP documents, and I'll be happy to provide the reference to that. Uh, there are several bands that uh, we can combine CBRS with either as carrier aggregation, both for example using LTE 
uh, if they are using a uh, 3GPP spectrum, 3GPP uh, technology, uh, as well as uh, combining 4G and 4, 4G and 5G, for example, using 4G in CVRS 5G in other bands or vice versa. Uh, so all of those are readily possible today. So the technology is defined for combining. Um, for many different bands. And as, as I said, I'll be happy to provide references to them. Um, in terms of the subleasing, so um, as Tim said, we started uh, deploying the PAL licenses uh, starting from April 15, 2021, about, uh, uh, about five months ago. So the PAL licenses have been, have been used in the past five months. We are in process of the development of a model uh, like an API, it's called Light Touch, that FCC allows the SaaS administrators to very quickly, in a matter of a, a few minutes, uh, to handle a leasing uh, transaction. So um, Federated Wireless in general is, is developing a, a full uh, um, spectrum market, uh, spectrum market um, uh, tool that includes all the aspect of leasing, but specifically talking to FCC and having the leasing approved traditionally has been used, has been using a something called Form 608, which is even possible today. That takes several weeks, but uh, we are working with FCC that the light touch process, uh, so if you, if you come up with an agreement with the, between the lessee and lessors, then within a few minutes, we can have that approved and, and uh, agreed and operated. And so basically it, it, the lease would be operational in a few minutes. Uh, my, my estimation, again, I'm not talking on behalf of FCC, but my estimation is that that light touch process for leasing would be perhaps available within next one or one and a half month. Uh, we have done a lot of trial with FCC. We are waiting for the final trial and the approval from FCC. And so the leasing would be available to all uh, PAL licenses using the light touch, even though the traditional and conventional leasing is possible today. So if you want to lease a PAL spectrum, you can do that today. But with light touch, perhaps you need to wait one or two months. It's interesting to me, Tim mentioned in a episode that it really I indicated this, the FCC has done a nice job in this case, and you don't necessarily always associate the government doing a nice job with the organization of our spectrum, mm. just like being kind of transparent. So do we think, looking back now a year, that they've accomplished their goal, and that, which in turn becomes our goal, of opening up CBRS to a larger mar market successfully? Do, do you sit now a year from out of it and say, hey, we they accomplished what they wanted to accomplish. Tim, you, you I, I, first yeah, I believe they have actually, sure, yeah. Uh, you know, when you see, uh, you know, like from a OEM perspective, we see people asking and buying antenna products that you would traditionally not really see getting into the LTE type of space, um, you know, and I think a lot of that is attributed to you know, the amount of lobbying that went behind, you know, working with the FCC. I know Federated was, you know, a huge spoon in that, that trough for, you know, feeding them with all kinds of stuff on how to do it. Uh, you know, their CEO, Ian, um, you know, I worked with him at Sprint. You know, he knew how to help manage and try to make the ecosystem work well. Um, and then you had the Googles and everybody else behind it too, trying to, you know, trying to make it as flexible as possible. And the good thing was, is that, you know, the, the agency was willing to listen to try to figure out how to use that spectrum that was really of no value, you know, outside of the Navy using it to make it valuable. Um, and I think through the platform that, uh, you know, the SAS platform, the way it was designed and developed gives a lot of really good flexibility in how to manage that, that interaction, uh, how to manage interference, uh, you know, when it, when it talks about overlay of networks. Uh, I think they've done a really good job at that and it really has opened it up to uh, to the situations where I talk with, you know, people that are four or five, you know, people in the company that are trying to set up a five node network all the way up to someone that's trying to do thousands of nodes. You know, it's, it really has opened up the dynamics for that. 
do you think it, and, and, and we said, Masood, I want to jump back to you before, let me, let me ask one quick question to Jesse and then I'm coming back to you about the CBR's effectiveness. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you think, um, Jesse, generally the wireless ISPs who were using the spectrum before don't like to be told what to do. And that's as a small or medium business, they, they're cowboys of sorts. Um, do you think it's been um, rolled out smoothly enough that they've accepted it in a way that, I know Katie mentioned a little bit of hesitancy there, but do you think it's been rolled out in a way that's been effective for those original legacy people? Yeah, for the most part, uh, and there's been a lot of improvements, right, from day one, right, to, to where we're at today you know, both on SaaS side and vendor side, you know, when it comes to the features and software and, and trying to make it more, you know, seamless uh, as far as getting CBSDs onboarded. Um, the, you know, the only areas that we see, you know, semi challenges with today are still within the DPA areas, um, but it's not as, it's not like before, um, you know, most SaaS vendors now have like single day or same day grants, so you can usually get your devices up and running. Um, but uh, I think for any fixed wireless applications, yeah, within those DPA areas, there's still the risk, right, for DPA activity, um, suspensions and things of that nature. So I think, you know, depending on where you're located, I, I know, uh, you know, obviously operators we work with, um, that are, you know, within those regions and the coastal areas, you know, they, you know, they always have, you know, concern, right, you know, <laughs> you know, how, how can I provide five, nine, acti you know, five nines reliability and so forth. Um, you know, on our end, we're trying to also work on, you know, adding multiple redundant grants and so forth to try to make it a little bit more robust, but, uh, um, but definitely and certainly from, you know, from first day of CBS launch to now, it, it, there's definitely been a lot of improvements and stability there. But I think if you're outside the DP area, like it's in in a sense, it's kind of unlicensed because you can still the the operator still has flexibility on what channels they can pick, and you know, it's based on the spectrum inquiry message. But the way, at least within our system, we allow the operators to set their preferred channels, and so they can rank them, and then based on uh, responses from the SaaS, right? Our software would, you know, pick the desired channels. So they still have the, the RF channel planning capability. Um, the question will be when GA coexistence kicks in, you know, how much of that, you know, kind of goes away a bit. But uh, for the most part now, right, if you're outside the DP area, you know, there's not much, right, <laughs> issues or concerns right now for, for most customers. Yeah. Okay, that's great. And back to you, Mr. Um, do you think the CBRS initiative has been effective? Oh, okay. <laughs> of course, uh, uh, I have to say yes. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. Definitely, yes, it has been. Um, so, um, so first of all, let me quickly address what the one thing that Jesse said. Uh, there are a couple of uh, a couple of areas uh, within the coastal area that there is a lot of radar activities, specifically, for example, Norfolk and San Diego, um, that we see more activity, but uh, the rest of them, uh, even though we have, we are not, we are not uh, allowed to keep the statistics of DPA activation, but it hasn't been very significantly impacting. So perhaps uh, even within the DPA area, first of all, the upper 50 megahertz is definitely available. They, they will not be impacted by the by the DPA. Only the lower hundred would be. Uh, but also, uh, even that, uh, uh, normally when a deep when a radar is activated, only one, maybe maximum two channel is is taken. So uh, there are availability. Uh, and also, I want to add the fact that uh, we are actively. I think you you mentioned uh, uh, Jerry and also Tim. We are actively working with DOD and uh, FCC and Navy to keep uh, relaxing and keep uh, making the spectrum allocation more efficient. So the good thing is that in the past one and a half year, we haven't seen a lot of complaint from DOD and uh, Navy. So basically, that's what you are mm, part of your question, Gary. That 
from an incumbent perspective, the uh, concern that we haven't heard any significant concern from DOD or Navy or any interference, objection, or complaint. And as a result, we are talking to them right now as we speak in a, in a very uh, regular manner. That, uh, and they're they are very open. I'm so happy and grateful that they're open, that we, we keep a study and identify the areas that we can relax and make the CBRs more efficient. Um, in terms of the coexistence, uh, so honestly, the way that at least we are looking at the coexistence, we would provide the available channels to the to the operators, and the operators can pick the spectrum within that. Can we, we provide the available spectrum uh, through the G, GAA and PAL coexistence scenario, and the user can pick within that range. So. Uh, I really don't see a major interruption or hiccup in the operation of the fixed operators, uh, as long as they kind of follow those spectrum inquiries. You know, I I agree with you. I think you guys have handled those interferences very well. Um, it, but you know, it just takes one of these operators to have a problem, and they tell the world. The <laughs> ninety-nine percent that work in great don't mention it. So. You're only held uh, to the standard of the one that made a, had a problem. So yeah. I, I understand that, and I and you never can be successful from that point of view. But I hear great things from what you're doing. Hey, Justin, I want to change the, uh, a little bit of the yep. the discussion and talk about our the the famous 5G that gets everybody's attention and how we move forward. How do, how do you see when we look with CBRS and 5G, what does that look like from a product point of view and what you guys are, are really looking to plan to support from uh, currently into over the next couple of years? Yeah, for sure. So from a uh, product point of view, we're seeing the technology, the antennas kind of evolving to meet the requirements for 5G. Um, so for when you're going to 5G, uh, typically when you're sub six gigahertz, you can support it on your, your traditional telecom bands, low and mid. Uh, but now they're integrating into the CBRS band, the 3.5 gig, and they have uh, set aside their, their spectrum just for, for this in those urban markets we talked about. So the antennas can be, uh, you, know, you know, beam forming, AT8R going up to 32 or 64. Just the, uh, the, the amount of complexity in the antenna is increasing. And of course the size, um, because we're in the sub six gigahertz band, uh, once you're increasing the amount of beam forming elements in the antenna, it, it is going to, going from a four port to an eight port, almost double in width, unless you're sacrificing something. So really, uh, you know, the technology has to kind of keep up with 5G, um, and, and, and it has been, but the, the leaders in that will be in the, you know, telecom space. And, and I think, you know, from the fixed wireless perspective, uh, we're, we're still a number of years out before uh, that's going to be adapted uh, or adopted in this space. Um, just the benefits over LTE um, for, for their use cases in terms of the you know, ultra low latency. Uh, not everyone's going to be needing that right now, the real time control. Um, the bandwidths are, are just outstanding, uh, but, but uh, you know, LTE seems to be sufficing right now. So yeah, that's is the it, way we're seeing it. Is it fair to say, um, if you, as you look forward from the 5G perspective, um, in the in the foreseeable future, two to three years, most of that 5G growth will be in metropolitan areas. Is that a fair statement? I I think for the next uh, few years that that is a fair statement. Until we start to see the use cases, these uh, verticals come up, uh, up more and more in these maybe industrial areas or suburban areas, which are going to need these uh, application or or these features of the five of 5G. Um, we're, when we see more of those, then we're going to see it start spreading out away from the very urban areas. So, so with the, um, to, another way to say that from a positive point of view is the rural and semi-rural areas uh, can take advantage of the CBRS LTE for the next few years with limited Oh yeah, it, it, it's, a, it's a natural transition. Once you have that uh, LTE network, then you, you can build on that to do a non-standalone 5G system. That's just the natural progression of what the carriers did and now what we're doing here. So following on the LTE path is great because you're looking towards the future now in, in case you are going to make that switch over to 5G. 
um, you, you're on that right spectrum at the 3.5 gigahertz. Um, the, the way it's regulated right now means, um, you know, you, you have some security on, on using that band. And, and Jesse, does, is that the way you anticipate the product um, development side on from buy sales going? Is that people would be developing, I mean, rolling out LTE with the long-term support of the 5G, or do you think LTE will be robust enough that there is, it is not a need for that transition? Well, so first, LTE still has a long life ahead, right? The ecosystem's very much growing still. Um, you can see, you know, the number of UE-supported devices almost weekly increasing. Um, so we definitely see that lasting you know several years uh, <laughs> uh many years from from now and uh 5g um you're seeing a lot of the 5g rollouts as was mentioned before like urban areas and a lot of like either um kind of macro deployments uh or maybe it's like the millimeter wave small cells but the the chipsets and the devices to support 5g um you know that's those are still a lot, a lot of cases early stages so 5G is still, you know, is, is still in my mind, not like super commercial, you know, to the wide scale audience yet. And there's not a ton of, uh, you know, like N48, N78 type devices out there. So there's not a lot of right, devices even supported as of yet for CBS. But, uh, you know, we're expecting, you know, next year, um, they'll just, you know, for that to start rolling out big time, right, as far as product availability, more equipment coming in to support 5G and the address space. The, you know, there's nothing preventing right 5G today <laughs> um, within CBRS. Uh, so it's more of just uh, the product landscape and all that to to come into the picture. But what I would say is, uh, um, so so firstly, yes, the and depending on what kind of product you deploy. So there there are solutions out there that you could deploy if it's like a RU. Uh, BBU kind of split architecture, like more traditional, generally those systems will allow for 5G by just swapping out the baseband. Um, so there's usually an upgrade path there. And we have a, a product line that we're launching to support that here pretty soon. Um, but a lot of the small cell with the baked in SOCs, there's not much right of an upgrade path because the phi layer and so forth is pretty limited to 4G. Um, so some of the devices, yeah, you won't have like a software upgrade or anything like that. But um, you know, there's there's other product lines that do have uh, a straightforward 5G path, and then you know the other thing you got to think about is the core piece. So um, the 4G core, <laughs> right, you're, isn't going to work unless you're doing some kind of non uh, standalone um, setup. So uh, most of the private deployments we're seeing are doing standalone, so it's a separate 5G core as well. Um, so this is all you know solutions that are available today, uh, but there's just not a, a, a huge, you know, availability uh, of products and, and, you know, UEs for 5G right now to take advantage of it. Um, and it's still quite a bit early. So, um, but the other point I want to make too on the, the 5G side is if you're comparing, you know, exactly same channel uh, bandwidths between LTE and 5G, if you're just looking at raw data throughput, your downlink isn't much better, right? It's not like this massive, <laughs> you know, doubling or quadrupling of, of performance. It's pretty much same bits per hertz. Um, the uplink though is, is you know, what we're kind of excited about because the uplink actually doubles because in LTE you're generally only doing a CISO one data stream on the up, which is generally what uh, is the first bottleneck <laughs> when people are doing fixed wireless. Uh, so 5G will at least have two data streams up. So that would definitely uh, benefit for sure, but um, but as of today, right, there's not much for, you know, unless you're going to buy very expensive macro equipment, there's not much for solutions out there for 5G. And, and it would, you know, there's not a, a big push, right, or, or driver to, to make that if you're looking at a uh, fixed wireless for the time being. Yeah, okay. yeah just go on. I, I was, was going to add in here that, you know, Jesse hit on it right there. It's like, you know, when you look at the 5G, ecosystem, you know, and, and, you know, you look at the technology curves of LTE versus where 5G is at. And, you know, those technology curves drive, you know, not only, you know, the different technology advancements in it, but it also drives cost, you know, cost structures. And LTE is now in that, you know, that plateau of the productivity stage. 
a lot more you know products are out there so the wisps that are really looking for you know an affordable cpe type of thing they're going to they're going to realize much better cost structures with an lte solution and you know just from past experience of working as a, in the operator space even like when we said hey we want to decommission you know the the next tell uh, assets we, it took 10 years to get it out of the network so i mean by the time you say yeah this can be in the life it takes a quite a long time so there's a pretty good transition in that process and to jesse's point it's like you know on the 5g side unless you look at trying to buy the uh you know the ferrari of the radio you're not going to really realize a, a lot of the real benefits of 5g through you know the smart antenna technologies where you can do you know, not only uh, horizontal, but also vertical beam forming and those type of things where you can really get a lot more bits per hertz uh, through that sector, you know, but the, the lower latency stuff will come in time. The LTE's done a really good job of bridging some of those gaps. Um, so you'll see it transition, but I think it's gonna be a longer life cycle for them to do it in the WISP area versus, uh, you know, the mobility sides. Yeah, they're, they're slow to bring the product down if it's not causing yeah. problems, you know, that's just money they have to spend that they're not willing to spend. Yeah. Can, right. can I add on, on, on 5G aspects? So, um, so obviously I, I agree with Jesse and, uh, and team that in the, in the fixed, uh, fixed, fixed ecosystem from a product development perspective, you might wait. Of course, uh, the, uh, the move by, uh, by Apple, you just heard uh, two weeks ago that iPhone 13 came out. And iPhone 13 actually includes CBRS as 5G, so it includes N48. And I'm hoping that that would motivate the market also that, uh, so that means chipset is available and it motivates the rest of the uh, kind of the different form factors also to take, to consider using 5G CBRS in their, in their plan. Uh, uh, so, and also I agree with Jesse and team that LTE is there, and I don't think for a foreseeable time we cannot say LTE is gone. So to that end, I would I would like to kind of put the put the concept of 5G into CBRS into four layers. So one layer is the the uh, technology availability from, in, from a radio perspective, and as you know, N48 has been approved a long time ago. There are chipsets, as I just mentioned, that are being used today. And also, um, I'm so glad to see that uh, there are so many combinations that are allowed to combine CBRS uh, as either 5G or LTE with other bands. Even, even the new concept of DSS, which is the, called dynamic spectrum sharing, which allowed you to, which allows you to flexibly change the CBRS band between 4G and 5G, depending on uh, the number of users that is in your market that is also available. So uh, technology is available. There are some product available, but of course we need to wait, especially in the fixed market. Then I, the, the second area that I want to address is the SaaS capability for 5G. Um, today, uh, we, SaaS, and I'm, I'm talking for about technology and federated wireless SaaS. I cannot talk on about other companies, other SaaS administrator, but Federated Wireless SaaS and the technology is capable today, as we speak, to uh, register and give grant to 5G CBSTs. So that is possible today. However, um, we need to do some uh, work to um, enhance the, the solution and use all the capabilities that 5G can provide. For example, making sure that the channel allocation that we do are more uh, uh, adaptable to 5G. Uh, and so basically we optimize it, or for example, doing some work related to uh, the dynamic beamforming that is not yet, uh, that, that is yet to be developed. Uh, so we have some work to do for the enhancement and optimization, but the basic 5G operation, as far as SaaS is concerned, is there today. And the final aspect of 5G that I want to address is about the network architecture. Obviously, um, one of the uh, areas that uh, we can look, at, especially CBRS is very successful, is the concept of private and enterprise networks, whether it is uh, fixed or, uh, or mobile. 
uh, that is uh, the, and we have done in CVR SLNS as one of my role as the chair of the network uh, services task group, we have developed all the requirements and identification and the, uh, the features needed to implement the uh, private network in the CBRS domain. So that is all available. If anybody is, is willing to see, I'll be happy to provide reference. So these are different angles that we are looking at 5G and uh, the ecosystem is working to make sure SaaS is enhanced and optimized to make the best use of 5G features, as I said, including dynamic beamform. Yeah, that's great. You know, th thanks for those. I think that's like the perfect, um, you know, perfect four areas that you highlighted, Masood. So that thank you for that. And um, I think, you know, we actually, this is a great conversation. I, um, this was a really good discussion about you know, the past couple of years and where we're at right now with, with CBRS and 5G and LTE. Um, so maybe why don't we, as we wrap up, let's just open up the floor to all four of you and maybe start with some, you know, do some final thoughts on where do you think we'll be in a couple of years with this? And, um, you know, really just final thoughts about the market. That sounds okay if you want to start with you, Tim. Sorry, did I catch you off guard? <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. No, I was, had some noise in the background, so I thought I would uh, yeah. mute there. Uh, yeah, I think you know, I think we're going to see a lot of really good things come out of the use of CBRS over the next few years. I think what we're seeing right now is we're seeing a lot of uh, interest in the areas of you know how do they use that. Uh, uh, you know, I think as the ecosystem starts educating people how the SaaS systems work, how do they work together. Uh, what happens in the case of an interference condition those type of things will help build confidence uh, within the industry and allow you know operators to be a little more uh, flexible in using those uh, in their use cases uh, i think we're going to also see uh, the additional interest and in expansion of that spectrum that goes beyond you know just their standard you know the municipalities we're seeing co colleges now interest in in the cbrs space we're seeing oil and gas industry you know we're seeing critical communications folks so it's really really has opened up that space so it's an exciting time you know for this application and expansion of within this spectrum and then if, when you start looking at what fcc is trying to do with c-band and then now the 3.4 below i think it's really going to be real interesting to see how that all comes together and how it plays together and you know the industry people are really lobbying to try to get the the EIRP limits of CBRS mm -hmm. adjusted. If they can get that adjusted and make it closer from a link budget perspective, I think that's going to help even fuel more of the CBRS applications. So yeah, excited to see. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. Um, how about you, Justin? Any final thoughts today? Yeah, no. I, um, so I think I think you know CBRS LTE is becoming more of a mature market now, right? And and from an antenna standpoint and and Maybe not a radio standpoint, but the antennas are are kind of you know evolved to their peak technology. Now it's about optimizing the response. Um, but what we're seeing is because CBRS with the PAL auction, it's we're, we almost have this turnkey solution that that these um, integrators or, or whoever can go to different verticals and, and present this network solution for them, where they can get off Wi-Fi. So we're going to have more specific use cases for CBRS, which are going to drive specific requirements for the antennas and the products. So we're going to see very, uh, maybe variations or configurations of our, our standard products that are going to address specific needs. So I'm really excited about that and kind of deep diving into these different industries and seeing you know, what they need and what is different from what you know a fixed wireless operator needs. Um, right. we, we might see that it transfers over and relates and, and now we have a product that's great for everyone. Um, I, th I think the uh, 900 megahertz Antrix with CBRS is a great example of that. Not many people were thinking about pairing 900 with CBRS before, but but it's changing mindsets of, of what kind of deployments you can do. It's not just 2.4, 3.4, 3.5, and 5.8. You know, it, it's it's now um, combining these different bands together to give a, a multi-layer, multi-spectrum level of service to your customers. Yeah, agree, agree. Yeah, it's definitely. Um even just like on the sales side, seeing some of the opportunities that our sales team is getting into, it's, it's stuff that you would never, you know, two years ago think about. So yeah, 
absolutely agree. Well, it's so much easier to get into this space, CBRS, as opposed mm -hmm. to one, yes. six, seven, yes. ten years ago. It, it took yeah. someone two, three years to ramp up, right, to get to yeah. speed where you're with everyone before you can start your own network. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, how about you, Masood? Yes, uh, thank you. I think Tim and Justin said a lot. I, I don't want to repeat that. Uh, fully agree. Um, I just want to emphasize on. By the way, Justin, uh, we just approved the uh, the use of the more more optimized 3D antennas. So if since that you are very much interested in antenna and talk, so CBRS can use more optimized antennas and the three dimensional radio patterns. Uh, from now on, so that that has been approved. We can talk about which, that. which aren't easy to get, by the way. <laughs> yeah, three <laughs> yeah, <pretty> patterns. <laughs> okay, good. So we can we can talk about that later. But uh, uh, I want to I want to add one thing that Tim uh, very quickly mentioned, but I want to emphasize on that, and that is the work that uh, things are gonna, as we move on, get better. It only can get better. And uh, uh, the reason that I'm saying is that number one we are the ecosystem getting more uh, familiar with CBRS. The SaaS operation has been helpful and efficient and useful in the market. Um, the availability, SaaS availability has been very high in the past one and a half year, except one, one case that we had a thunderstorm. There has been almost always availability. Um, and uh, uh, also, I want to add the fact that uh, if the government and the incumbent community are, uh, given the experience they had, they are working with us to see, make the CBRS more efficient for the users uh, by perhaps relaxing some of the requirements. Uh, uh, Tim mentioned about the add, adding the possibility of higher power CBSDs. Uh, of course, uh, Federated as a, as a SaaS company, we don't have a position there, but if that is allowed, we know very well how to incorporate that in the ecosystem. And finally, I want to add the fact that uh, we are working closely with the government to open up this type of uh, shared dynamic shared spectrum in other bands. Very specifically, we are talking to government about uh, other bands in three, three gigahertz range uh, below 3.45 and also uh, in the kind of centimeter and millimeter wave. Uh, so I can tell you that for all these reasons, I'm very uh, optimistic about the, um, and also product development. Of course, I need to mention Bicels and other companies and also device uh, ecosystem. Uh, I'm very optimistic and I'm hoping that the next time that we have this webinar, we can have uh, a much better statistics on uh, CBRS without pandemic. <laughs> Us too. All right, Jesse. Congrats. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, not too much really extra to add. I think we touched on a lot of subjects here, but uh, I mean, we're definitely expecting the growth to really start exploding. Um, you know, a lot of what's been deployed uh, you know, as far as new verticals, new use cases, and so forth, there's been tons and tons of POCs. Um, mm -hmm. But we're, you know, we're on the verge of many of those POCs and special use cases to really take off. Um, you know, another thing I think about is, um, in a sense, the MVNOs are trying to also become their own MNOs because now they have this spectrum they can deploy on. So you're, you're seeing that, um, you know, <laughs> uh, those kind of networks being built uh, at wide scale right now. And uh, so the number of CBSDs, uh, <laughs> I would be shocked if it's if it's not, you know, if we have this call again next year, it's not, you know, quadrupled based on, you know, the trajectory we're seeing, um, you know, with the number of deployments. And another thing I truly believe is that eventually this band will be quite popular in the SMB space. Um, and when that happens, you know, we're talking, you know, now millions of devices uh, being deployed. Um, so I think there's definitely use cases there for, you know, any small business, medium-sized business to, you know, overlay their existing Wi-Fi network with CBRS, um, whether it's, you know, doing some kind of, uh, you know, roaming for their normal phones, or if it's just for private uh, internal network, you know, for a variety of other reasons, but it's, a, you know, an, it's pretty much interference free, especially if you're indoors like that. And uh, so, yeah, I think the, 
you know, there's going to be a very explosive growth. Uh, you know, we're about to witness that, I think, very soon with CBRS. Oh, agreed. Yeah, that's great. I actually was just shooting Gary a message of other questions that I, we're just out of time and we, we can't ask them, but we will definitely have to have um, a follow-up discussion from, from this webinar. So, um, you know, thank you all. I, you know, thank you to our partners, Alpha and Buy, Sells and Federated. We really appreciate this. And um, this, I think, was a great discussion and, and we're looking forward to having more of these. So thank you. Thank you, Absolutely. everyone. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having us out. All right. Have a wonderful day. Thank you to the audience for attending. Um, and this will be recorded and posted on our site so you can share it. So thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye. Bye.